I'm Raina Lampkins Filder, curator for the Souls Grown Deep Foundation and curator of Souls Grown Deep Like the Rivers, black artists from the American South. You are listening to Hoxton Radio. Yeah, for the show here, um, obviously we, you know, there's a c- certain story that we wanted to tell and also there's a space in which we can show it. So here we have 64 works by 34 of the artists represented in the collection. But I feel that even with this kind of um, uh, a more sort of uh, homogenized version of the collection, it gives uh, a very nice introduction to, in many respects, to some of the concerns, some of the kind of aesthetics, some of the use of materials that artists from these areas and certainly from our collection use. So it gives a really, I think, a really nice snapshot of the work, the overall work in our collection, but definitely of, of the work. Um, in that area and within our collecting. On materials, Mm. a lot of it is reclaimed pieces. Yes, the sort of defining ethos for many of these artists, for sort of all of them here, is to um, make use of with what you have, make do. Um, Nothing is just to be thrown away. And so, uh, and also many of the artists grew up in circumstances uh, that were perhaps economically challenging, or they didn't really have access to, you know, an art supply store. And also for many of the artists, if they went to an art supply store, there might be those who looked at them um, in a kind of unapproving way. So, um, but also I think these artists are, um, can find the beauty in the, the, item that is used because there's a history already embedded within it. You are kind of communing with your natural environment. You are um, kind of accessing the ancestors. We stood opposite the yard show mm-hmm. here, um, which is where some of these works would have been displayed in people's houses, in yeah. their front porches, yeah. in, their, in, yeah. their, in their homes. Absolutely. Um, the yard show, which is a very, very southern thing, um, that kind of began in the 19th century, and that's, you know, for many of these artists, they were not permitted to, you know, go into a museum, let alone, you know, show work in a museum or a gallery. I mean, that just wasn't a thing. And so if you wanted to expose your work, you had to do it where you could do it, which is on your property. Also, artists were, were creating work that was, you know, perhaps in graveyards and in, you know, historically black cemeteries in the woods where one could freely create without fear of, um, quite literally, the lynch mob. Mm. How safe was it for these artists to be making these work or even to be artists? It was a consistently unsafe environment. And I think that's something that runs through in some ways, the biographies of many of these artists, even if it isn't overly stated or if it isn't something that is um, that they themselves even wish to kind of sort of talk about, it's just that common experience of like being a black person in, in a place and a time where, uh, you know, Thornton Dial actually says it really well. And, um, I'm not going to quote it directly, but, um, but he, he, he basically says that, you know, um, that the white man didn't want a black person to know anything, kept them ignorant. So when you have, like, if a black person shows that they know something, that is kind of considered, like, wait a minute, let's kind of push them down a little bit. We don't want that to happen. So we're not gonna educate you. We're not gonna let you, we're not gonna allow you or let you know or just have a space for you to express yourself. We don't want you to, to be, to do, to explore. For so many of these artists, you know, they were accused of, um, whether it's sorcery or uh, being, um, you know, just like not really, it wasn't appreciated, their artistic voice. And so artists, I mean, some of the stories are quite, um, are quite remarkable. Um, The sort of physical abuse that one could even receive by just wanting to show your work, just wanting to be an artist. We've got a whole room um, dedicated to the quilt makers mm. of G's Bend. Yeah. There's quilts all across the show. Can yeah. you tell us a little bit more about these, these works? Right, well, the G's Bend is a pretty remarkable place. It's a really small community in Alabama, and the way that it's situated is there's a, it's a community that then is kind of completely, well, on all three sides, there's the Alabama River that goes around it. 
So the so Gee's Bend is quite an isolated place. Uh, still is very very rural. Um, it's had a really long history in that the kind of descendants of the enslaved people who were residing on that land, uh, uh, the descendants primarily, many of them still remain in that area. The way that the women in the Bend kind of create their quilts, it's again using repurposed recycled material. And so because you could never really know in some ways the type of material, material you would get, that allowed for like an enormous amount of experimentation. You know, quilt making for so many people, they imagine there's a very strict pattern and, it's, and it repeats in this kind of, and that's the, the point to make this kind of perfection of, of repetition. For the quilt makers in Tees Bend, partly because of the, um, the material that was used, a, that kind of repetition in a certain way, if you have eight different types of material or strips or pieces, um, you couldn't necessarily predict. So that allowed you to have quilts that are, you know, really improvisational in nature, that really are expressive in a way that I think people find um, really kind of seductive in the work.